Thank you everyone for joining. And it's a, it's a pleasure to welcome you all today to uh, Images of Resistance uh, virtual as well as physical exhibit launch. Wanakam, hello. We are happy to be here together on this land tonight to share this experience. We are grateful for the land bringing us together to build community and to continue to learn from one another. We are mindful of the land and the responsibility we hold within it under the dish with one spoon covenant to share and care for the land. We thank the original caretakers and stewards of this land, the Haudenosaunee, Mississaugas of the Karib and the Anishinaabe people. For tonight's gathering, we center our intentions around this land covenant of only taking what we need, leaving space for others and keeping the space cared for. This exhibit reflects on the 2008-2009 protest as well as the genocide faced by Tamil people on the island of Sri Lanka. It is therefore imperative to recognize our own roles as settlers on this land where another genocide occurred. As, as a displaced population whose lives and bodies bear the effects of war, we must confront our own privileges and notions of solidarity with indigenous communities on Turtle Island. During the iconic Gardner protest in May 2009, Indigenous groups stood in powerful solidarity alongside the Tamil community, strengthening our calls for liberation. As refugees, children of refugees and immigrants, we are evidence of Canada, Canadian nation building. And it's upon us to disrupt the same systems that oppress Indigenous peoples. My name is Nathan Shan. I work as the Chief Executive Officer at Tamil Civic Action. It's a pleasure to welcome you all again. This exhibit is an important milestone for us. Uh, we are glad to be partnering with Myzeum Toronto to bring this exhibit to life, both physically and virtually. And uh, the exhibit is something that many, many people have worked together for many years. And uh, it's important that we acknowledge the support Myzeum Toronto has brought to this project. And so with that, I would like to bring for ask uh, Nadine, uh, Vilesen Feldman, the Director of uh, Programming at Myzeum of Toronto, to offer greetings and welcome on behalf of Myzeum Toronto. Thank you, Nathan. Um, I'll just start by providing you with a description of myself and my surroundings. I'm sitting on a green couch surrounded by some decorative cushions. Uh, I'm a Filipino woman with dark black hair that is wavy and just above my shoulders. Um, and tonight I'm wearing a patterned v-neck cardigan. Uh, as Nathan mentioned, my name is Nadine Villasine Feldman. I'm the Director of Programming at Museum of Toronto. And I'd like to welcome you to Museum's sixth annual Intersections Festival and today's program, Images of Resistance and Archive of Action. Um, the Intersections Festival is an annual citywide arts and cultural festival that explores Toronto through diverse intersectional perspectives. And every year we have uh, the privilege and the honor of partnering with individuals, artists, community groups, heritage associations, museums, and more um, to provide a, a, and present a wide variety of programs. Um, this year's festival is taking place um, from April to June and adopts a new hybrid model balancing outdoor physical exhibits with virtual exhibits, events, and uh, online experiences. So before we begin, I would just like to um, express my appreciation and, and give a huge thank you to our Images of Resistance project partners, the Tamil Civic Action Center, Nithan Shan, Ninai Guval, uh, Hiba Abdallah, the Fort York National Historic Site and the City of Toronto. I'd also like to thank our festival funders, Canadian Heritage, the Ontario Cultural Attractions Fund, as well as our community donors from Quad Real Property Group Toronto, the McLean Foundation, and the Downtown Young BIA. Um, so just some last information on this program. Uh, this event is an hour and a half long and includes live reflections and conversations amongst organizers and participants in the 2008 to 2009 Toronto human rights protests against the Tamil genocide in Sri Lanka. Um, this program will also include recorded media featuring archival footage, the Fort York exhibition and music. 
and we'll close with a question and answer period at the end. Um, so please, uh, it's a long program, please feel free to take breaks as you need them. Um, there will be a full recording of the event uh, available on the MyZoom website several weeks following this event, uh, but it can also be found immediately after the program on MyZoom's Facebook page. So thank you again for joining us and I will pass things back to Nithan to begin the program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadine, for your um, remarks, but also most importantly, collaborating with the Tamil community in bringing this uh, exhibit to life. And uh, it's been a pleasure working with my CM Toronto and the staff. Uh, uh, we will move right into our programming. Um, the, as, as Nadine mentioned, this is focused on the 2008-2009 Tamil Canadian protest. As many of you are aware, um, tens of thousands of people uh, turned out to many protests from um, later part of 2008 to all the way up to June of 2009. And on certain uh, protests, we even had uh, more than 50,000 people at, at one point uh, in downtown Toronto. So the level of organizing that went behind the level of mobilization that went behind is historic for Toronto's history as well as for the Tamil community's history, but also the kind of pain and the suffering that, that was present during those times and continue to be present today is also of great significance. And so um, the community uh, continues to remember those protests uh, with pride uh, in terms of organizing, but also with a heavy heart that we weren't able to stop the genocide, which we were on the streets for calling for the government of Canada to intervene and to stop the genocide. What we knew on those days as, uh, as a genocide, when on certain days we know tens of thousands of people were dying, uh, we knew that because we were hearing from our family members uh, but different levels of government across the globe um, failed to recognize what was happening. And today, after a decade, many have realized that what was happening there was genocide. And many have realized that tens of thousands of lives were lost that could have been prevented. Um, so while the helplessness still continued during the protest, we weren't sitting back and watching what was happening. We as a community, along with our allies, were there out on the streets, at least making an attempt to make sure that we were able to do what was within our, our bounds to bring attention to the genocide and, and make an attempt to halt the genocide. So we are going to go into watching a clip right now of the protests that took place in 2008, 2009 across the globe that will show the mobilization of the community to stop the genocide. Well, there's a sea of protesters on Parliament Hill tonight, and it continues to grow. Busloads of Tamil supporters are pouring into Ottawa. Members of the Tamil community were out by the thousands all afternoon and into the evening. They're hoping to draw attention to the Sri Lankan government's military offensive against the Tamil Tigers. Today's demonstration was one of several in recent days in the GTA. Dozens of people gathered in downtown Atlanta today to bring attention to what they call genocide in South Asia. The protesters say the government in Sri Lanka has launched attacks on the civilian Tamil minority. They believe those attacks have caused a humanitarian crisis that must be addressed. Meanwhile, several thousand protesters from Australia's Tamil community have gathered in Melbourne and Sydney, calling for an end to the civil war in Sri Lanka. The noisy protesters claim that the Sri Lankan government's recent offensive against the Tamil Tigers, Tigers of Elan amounts to genocide against ethnic Tamils. Thousands of British Tamil protesters blockaded Parliament Square to call for a ceasefire. It's day 14 of the protests. Tamil Nadu will be up in flames and protests will continue over the treatment meted out to the Lankan Tamils by the government. I don't know what happened to humanity. What, what's going on? Like, people don't care. They let this happen in Rwanda, they let this happen in Serbia, and they're going to let this happen in Sri Lanka. And because there's no witnesses to any of this, this whole war has been, you know, been no witnesses to any of what's going on, and that's why the world's allowed 20,000 civilians to be slaughtered, and still, there's still atrocities going on there. So after Britain gave independence to uh, Sri Lanka only for the Sinhalese, not for the Tamils. This is the freedom struggle. 
Family Willem should be free immediately. We have made some changes. This is probably the most impact we've had throughout the whole history of the struggle. So we're getting somewhere, but it's very slow, and we need things to be changing quickly. I mean, even today, the Sri Lankan army advanced right into the safe zone in Sri Lanka, and they're using a very heavy weapons on innocent civilians. So, as you can imagine, we're very frustrated that not enough is being done in order to change things. And when we ask them, why did you do that? You're one of the great powers of the world and you can't control that little island. They say, oh, we're not a superpower, we're not the US. You're not the US, you're still a great power. You've had colonial influence there. You have economic ties to the country. You're one of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council. And we think it's about high time that they started doing something about it. Good evening. Responding to bad news from their homeland, hundreds of Tamil protesters shut down an expressway through downtown Toronto tonight. Traffic on the elevated highway was backed up for several kilometers and caused major backups on other routes throughout the city. Hundreds of police officers were on the scene trying without success. I would like to thank a Tamil Freedom Coalition for providing uh, that video and uh, have compiled together um, the Tamil Canadian protest as well as protest across the globe by the Tamil diaspora around the world. And um, the, the content today will talk a lot about the genocide, the impact of the genocide will talk a lot about the loss of lives. It may be triggering uh, to, to some of you, it may bring back uh, trauma uh, and, and past memories. Uh, we, we wanted to let you know, please uh, look at the chat for some of the resources that are available for you that you can reach out to. and. Uh, please feel free to make use of those resources and please feel free to, um, if you have to excuse yourself from the program and come back as well, it's not a, a problem at all. Thank you very much for being here. We are going to move into hearing reflections from uh, four people who were a part of uh, the protest um, in one form or the other, um, reflecting back, thinking back uh, their involvement and bringing some of their memories and reflections today. Um, we will start with Arani. Uh, Arani was a youth organizer who organized uh, many of the protests and was also um, one of the people talking to media, uh, creating awareness about the genocide that was happening. Uh, she's currently the director of people operations at the culture at King Arsa, a Toronto based ad tech agency. She was someone who was heavily involved in the Tamil movement over a decade. Arani, please join us in bringing your reflections. Uh, welcome everyone. I guess I'll start off um, with a, just a quick introduction of myself for those people who may not be able to see me right now. I'm a South Asian Tamil female just sitting in my chair um, in my study room in Markham. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, the reflection is quite heavy because as Neeth mentioned, I was heavily involved for quite some time um, during the during the protest, but even before that, just trying to understand everything that was happening in Sri Lanka. Um, I vividly recall a lot of, um, you know, a lot of footage that we were constantly receiving. I remember um, feeling very helpless, especially when an orphan home got attacked. And this was prior to, uh, or early uh, 2007, I believe. Um, and uh, just knowing that I had gone there uh, a few years ago, a few years prior, and I I'd seen those children myself. And that was what really stuck with me. Um, and I knew that we had to be a voice for the voiceless. Um, I personally was actually born and raised in Canada. Um, and my parents were not victims of trauma. They, they, they actually were lucky enough to leave the country well before the war started taking place. Um, but I remember from uh, recalling, you know, their stories and their accounts of what their family members had gone through, which kind of led curiosity for me to learn more um, being involved in the protests, especially during 2008, 2009, was such an eye opener. I remember speaking to many media representatives, and I think there's still articles out there um, where they were like, why are you so involved? Why is this such a, you know, what is it that, you know, what is it that's drawing you to this cause? And it's like, what's drawing me to the cause is that these are my, my these are literally like my brothers and sisters. This, this land belongs to our families. This land is somewhere um, you know, that that ties back to my blood and my roots and knowing that there's a genocide happening and knowing that there's no voice for these individuals, it just, it really hurt. And um, at the time, the Canadian government 
had not spoken up. Not many politicians came out. It took months and months of us being on the streets and marching through the cold. Uh, and as Nathan mentioned, lots, thousands and thousands of people showing up before we started getting proper recognition. And, um, you know, at some point, some some politicians came out to speak, but uh, it wasn't enough, obviously. And uh, I remember, you know, um, the police, I remember speaking to um, the Canadian Intelligence Services, RCMP officers, and, and just trying to educate people on what was really happening and why us as Thummels are marching the streets and why it really mattered. Um, and it was really funny because I often told people, like, I think we're leaving the streets cleaner than what they were in downtown Toronto because our purpose here is really to educate. And I, we want our voices to be heard. We want to be able to really bring attention to what the Sri Lankan government is doing to our families um, and now, obviously, yeah, a decade later, that there is a lot more awareness and a lot of governments have stepped up and a lot of people are questioning what's happened on the island. But during that time, getting those footages and really watching and really understanding, um, you know, what was happening was very difficult. And uh, our, I think my part and my contribution there was just really to be able to voice for the voiceless. And I really think it was about educating individuals and the passion and the fire really led came from the people who are marching with us every day, came from families just hearing stories um, and recollecting, you know, their memories of what they went through, but also just what their families were co currently going through. And knowing that, you know, if we don't stand up, if we don't give a voice, if, if we stay st silent, the genocide is just going to worsen. And uh, we knew that we couldn't allow that to happen. And that was my recollection of everything. Thank you. Thank you very much. Arni for, uh, for coming back and sharing your memories and your reflections of the protest. Arni is, uh, is an example of the young woman who led the organizing, you know, during the time youth were instrumental in spearheading the protest in terms of speaking out and creating awareness. And um, the Tamil woman, Tamil young woman in particular had a leadership role in, uh, and Arni, thank you very much for reflecting on that. As she mentioned, you know, the, the protest went on for months before the final Gardner protest took place. And Gardner got a lot of attention, obviously, um, as, as it uh, disrupted the traffic um, more. But many, many, many days of uh, sidewalks being lined up by human chains by tens of thousands of people. In fact, with no incident, with, uh, with actually, as you mentioned, uh, being uh, left cleaner than, uh, than uh, within hours of leaving the protest, nobody would realize that there were tens of thousands of people right there. In that place, uh, but having seen no action, having seen no um, response uh, from the federal government of that time, uh, particularly left a lot of uh, Tamil Canadians, particularly young Canadians, feeling alienated, feeling like they weren't respected as equal Canadians. Uh, if these were uh, people uh, not of brown skin color uh, protesting, maybe a thousand people uh, would have gained so much more attention that the fact that fifty thousand people on the on the ground of downtown weren't able to get the attention of even making a statement by the prime minister of that time was disappointing. But, um, but I think one of the silver lining uh, of, that, of that protest time is the relationship the Tamil community and Tamil youth particularly made with the student movement of the time. So we have a representative next who was involved with the student movement of the time. Um, we have a a Angela Renier, who was, the executive, who, who was the executive director of the University of Toronto Student Union from 2008 to 20, 2011. And at the time of the mass demonstration in 2009, she held that role. She spent over a decade involved in student organizing and international solidarity across Canada. She currently works in the labor movement organizing healthcare workers in Alberta. Angela is currently the past president of the Canadian Research Institute for the Advancement of Women. So Angela, thank you very much for joining us today. And I hope... Uh, um, you're doing well, and thanks for bringing reflections from your role as a labor, as a as a student movement leader in the struggle at that time. Thank you, thank you, Nathan. And um, my name is Angela Renier. I go by the pronouns she and her. I'm joining you from my home office in Calgary. Um, first off, I just want to say it's an honor to be here, and I would like to congratulate the organizers of this wonderful project. As Nathan had mentioned in 2009, I was the executive director of the University of Toronto Students' Union. And um, in thinking about this, uh, 
the years leading up to those demonstrations that we're commemorating today, um, students were really active in the Toronto area on a number of uh, solidarity movements uh, across student movements or across students unions and with other social movements. Um, they were organizing around struggles with the anti-war movement, the labor movement, on environmental and indigenous rights issues. And another example of this would be when teaching assistants would have been on strike at York University, students from Ryerson and University of Toronto would go and join those picket lines. Um, students went up to north of Toronto to support indigenous peoples and community members protecting the freshwater um, of the Alliston Aquifer from becoming a dump site. And among these student organizers that I met during those times, there were so many extremely committed and articulate Tamil students who were organizing on a range of social issues while also talking to those of us outside of the community about the struggles of the displaced Tamil community and their brothers and sisters back at home on the island. And, um, and you know, speaking very articulately about the distress of this community. And so because of this network of organizers and the incredible leadership, as Nithan had mentioned, of the Tamil youth, when callouts for action were made, extensive networks could be notified to join marches and vigils and other types of actions. So on that May 9th, that was no different. After getting call outs and texts and watching the live streams on the news of the Gardner blockade, many of us uh, went to join our brothers and sisters from the Tamil community at the Gardner. <clears throat> when I arrived at the blockade, I very much remember being completely in awe and inspired by the very incredibly brave women who are making a human chain in front of the riot police. And I went to join them in solidarity. And shortly after joining them, I was arrested with a few others peacefully participating in that human chain. <clears throat> I believe that it was shortly after a few of us were arrested that the, the organizers had negotiated with the police to end the blockade and just thinking back on all of this, I have to say that I'll always be affected by the warmth and solidarity that I received and the other allies from the Tamil, received from the Tamil community in the aftermath of the Gardner, despite all the pain and grief that they were experiencing within their community. Um, so I'll, I'll just leave it there, but I'll just say, you know, it, it's so wonderful to see these kind of events commemorating this incredible time, this historic moment, and also taking the opportunities for us to remember the atrocities that took place at that time and the continued struggle for self-determination of the Tamil people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Angela, for, uh, for your reflection and thanks for the work you did uh, with the Tamil community uh, during those um, very difficult years. Thanks for putting yourself on the line. Uh, you know, allyship is about, about finding ways to put yourself in a place to protect um, others who are more targeted and more vulnerable. And, and you were there um, helping the Tamil community, the Tamil youth, um, standing in solidarity in, in various ways, including being at the Gardner. Um, Angela reflected on, on the youth, um, youth movement and uh, one of the reflections we have today is also how young people then went on to pursue various leadership roles within uh, student movement. Many, many young people became leaders of the student movement and York University, Ryerson, um, also at um, U of T Scarborough campus and many other places we have seen enormous amount of uh, leadership emerging out of the protest, uh, the experience of the protest, then taking on leadership role within the student movement and that that uh, that time solidified and strengthened the collaborations between our young people and the student movement and they became more actively involved. Our next speaker is coming from the labor movement. Again, as Arani mentioned, we didn't see a lot of elected representatives, but we definitely had the allyship of student movement and the labor movement. Labor movement was critical. Many labor leaders um, came to the protest, participated in the protest, 
offered support. Many labor unions passed uh, resolutions to support uh, the international investigation that we were calling for into the genocide. And one of those labor unions was the United Steelworkers and United Steelworkers Toronto Area's president, Carolyn Egan is here. Um, she's the president of the United Steelworkers Toronto Area Council and is on the executive board of the Toronto and York Region Labor Council. She's the co-chair of the Good Judge for All Coalition has worked in worked for many years in the women's movement in the city. And, um, and Carolyn, I remember seeing you many, many times during the protest uh, as an ally. And thank you very much for joining back to reflect on, on the protest today. Well, thank you very much, uh, Nithan. And I'm, I'm very honored to be here with you all today. Uh, this is an incredibly important moment, I think. And the launch is uh, preserving the memory of what happened, certainly in Sri Lanka, the horrific genocide in 2008, 2009. But as people are saying, uh, the incredible solidarity uh, that, that developed at that time, certainly uh, the base of which was the uh, Tamil community, but also the broader Canadian and global uh, community as we saw in some of those earlier slides. I wanna talk particularly about the United Steelworkers. We're a private sector union right now with about 14,000 members in Toronto and York region. And at that time, there were probably thousands of uh, Tamil members in our workplaces. And I will say so many of them became activists in their workplaces, becoming stewards, becoming unit presidents, becoming local presidents. I remember uh, in, uh, in, in workplaces like uh, Canuck Kitchen, Rockman Doors, uh, shade o -Matic, many of which have closed now, sadly, because of the effects of the economic recession, et cetera. But uh, these, these, uh, these activists uh, really became a, a part and parcel of, of the blood and the, the heart and the soul of our union and uh, were explaining to us what was going on in the island of Sri Lanka, the oppression that was taking place, the struggle for national liberation. And a few years before what happened in 2002, uh, 2008, nine, the tsunami uh, struck there. And uh, at that point, uh, the talk was on what had happened, the destruction, the devastation. And we started to do plant gate collections at that time, uh, raising money from members. And it gives you the opportunity to talk with members way beyond the Tamil community about what was needed. And we raised enough funds to uh, actually establish a medical lab in Kilinochi, which was the center of the struggle in many senses. A plaque recognizing our contribution was on that lab. And it served the uh, community there until it was overrun by the Sri Lankan army. And we were told destroyed in, I think, January of 2000. And so we, we, we learned about that struggle through that, 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 uh, that uh, joint solidarity that we, we were developing. And uh, because of the active involvement of, uh, of Tamil members in our union, uh, they provided educational centers at our area council where representatives from all our workplaces come together on a monthly basis for a day long political discussions, et cetera. Videos explaining the history, the liberation struggle, why it was so important and why solidarity was so important. And, uh, and it allowed our members to open their minds and fully understand why when this community, the Tamil community was in, uh, in, in crisis, we had to be there and we were there the, up at the, uh, uh, at the Ottawa demonstration in front of parliament at the Scarborough Town Centre, the Markham uh, Fairgrounds, and of course the, the Gardner Expressway, that, that uh, extraordinary demonstration. And uh, this was hugely, hugely important. It was not only our union, the Toronto and York Region Labour Council, John Cartwright and so many others also played a role in helping develop the solidarity that was necessary because we felt uh, obviously the struggle was taking place in Sri Lanka, but we had to do everything, everything we could to prevent, uh, to prevent what we saw as genocide at that time. And, uh, uh, and support and, and broaden the understanding of the self-determination of the Tamil people. And, and we felt very strongly that it was a role of unions, not simply to, well, important as it is, protect our members in the workplace, but also take uh, a part uh, in movements for liberation, movements against oppression. And, uh, and, uh, and we have seen that whether it be the women's movement, as people have said before, the anti-racist movement, the environmental movement, we have seen members of the Tamil community uh, step forward to protect the rights in the workplace of their fellow workers, but fellow community members as well. And uh, I think the role of, of Tamil activists enriched our unions with their activism and their solidarity, and they moved our members to understand the uh, 
critical importance of international uh, issues such as the struggle for self-determination that they were involved in in Sri, in Sri Lanka was a union issue as well as a, uh, a, just, a just and, and human rights issue. So sadly, we know what the outcome was, the massacres, the atrocities, but we're very proud of the role that trade unions uh, played, uh, standing shoulder to shoulder with, with the Tamil community, and we continue to stand uh, with you now in your ongoing struggle. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carolyn, for joining us. And thank you very much for um, all the work that you've done uh, on human rights front uh, through your role at United Steelworkers and, and broadly in the social justice movement. And it's important to also recognize, as Carolyn did, the work of many, many workers, Tamil workers who belong to United Steelworkers and making sure their union members and their union leadership was uh, able to find out more and become more aware. And that's not uh, just limited to steelworkers union, it happened in many, many other unions. And, and so at this point of time, I wanna make sure that we acknowledge the work that our, our, our Tamil sisters and brothers who worked in multiple difficult employment opportunities, employment positions were able to convince and, and to be able to educate their peers and their employers and their unions in, in bringing them on as allies in the struggle. Our next speaker is Priyant. Priyant is an Ulam Tamil who actively participated in the 2009 protest and the former spokesperson of Tamil Youth Organization of Canada. Priyant completed his public policy degree at Ryerson University to understand the role of Canadian public policy in relation to international politics. He's currently managing Alpha Abroad Canadian Immigration Services and immigration firm focused on simplifying Canadian immigration for people around the world. Priyant was uh, a key uh, activist in organizing many of those protests during the 2008, 2009 period at a high school level, uh, being a high school student at that time, uh, many, many high schools also participated in the protests, including a protest outside Toronto District School Board. Uh, unfortunately, as Toronto District School Board started to become, um, uh, started to censor a lot of conversation around the genocide for high school students. And they had uh, taken one of the protests also to the TDSV head office as well. So Priyant, uh, joining us uh, to bring some reflection. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Nidhananna. Uh, I think 2009 literally changed my life. Um, I did not, I entering that phase, I did not know anything. Um, but as days went by, I'll, I'll just give you a context of what we went through. Um, so every day, Tamils were dying in hundreds and thousands. Someone's sister, brother, and sometimes an entire family just murdered because we wanted political freedom to live as Elam Tamils without being persecuted. That specific day, I believe it hit home for everyone. We got tired of hearing the same sentences from Canadian politicians back to back. And some, some, some young guys and girls just started marching. We just kept going and going. And the more we walked, the more we just wanted to make a statement to the world to stop the massacre. The point we saw the highway, I'm sure it went through everyone's mind. And even if it didn't, there was this one cop, I believe, who yelled out something along the lines, these guys are going to get on the highway. And, and at that point, even the most ignorant person in the crowd got the message. And, and we rushed up the ramp while some of us were getting hit by batons. And at this point, um, most of our uncles and aunties in the community were, were protest veterans because we've been protesting saying the same thing back to back for months and months. And they knew exactly what to do and, and they took over the highway. Um, then you had these women and children like marching up to the front to the police so they wouldn't be able to disperse the gathering on the highway. Um, and you know, like harsh words were thrown at us. And, and for us, it was only about one thing. Just a moment, listen to us. The people we call family back home are being butchered mercilessly by heavy weapons, cluster bombs and chemical weapons. We trusted this world entering a peace process only to be betrayed into one of the world's most horrific set of events. For many here in Toronto, it was a first world discomfort to get our highway blocked. But before I got on that highway, I was 18. I saw a video from back home where a pregnant woman was dead on the ground and a tiny hand piercing out of her womb. We couldn't stop a baby dying inside her womb. That's the guilt we have to live with for over a decade and probably will never end until we get justice for all the lives that were lost. But for most people, 
they only had to live with the highway being blocked for a couple of hours. Until it's mentioned, you probably wouldn't even remember it. But even today, we have to live with the news that Tamils are being harassed, threatened, and assaulted in their own homeland, in our own homeland, by Sri Lankan government forces. Even today, I don't think any Tamil would ever want the roles to be reversed because no one should ever be in that place seeing their loved ones slaughtered mercilessly because of your identity. That moment alone pushed hundreds of young people to pursue various political pathways for justice for Elam Tamils. If, if world peace was ever a thing, then I strongly believe it starts with the justice for the Tamil genocide. I hope there is a day I can look back at this event and tell myself the world actually cares about injustices happening around them. Thank you very much, Priyant. Thanks for, thanks for sharing and thanks for reliving those difficult times again to, to create awareness. I know it's not easy for us to come and share these things. It, it, is, it takes a lot of courage, takes a lot of, uh, um, a lot of toll on our health to, to keep creating this awareness, but thank you very much for doing this and continuing to lead in many ways um, the, the activism today. So at this time, we're gonna shift, shift gears a little bit. We're gonna talk more specifically about the exhibit itself. We heard about the reflection, so that you have a context of what these protests were about, but now we move on to uh, the actual display, actual um, archive. Of, of action. So I would like to invite Hiba Abdullah. Hiba is an artist and organizer who frequently works with others. Her practice explores locality, civil, civic resilience, and political structures as tools for fostering collaborative agency. She received her BFA from University of Windsor in 2012 and her MFA from the University of Gulf in 2017. She currently lives and works in Toronto, Ontario. It's, it's been a, a pleasure to work with Hiba on this project. And uh, when we had initially um, uh, started talking about curator for this project, somebody who can come on and help us shape this, um, uh, you know, as, as we have often been in spaces where we get people who may not understand, may not relate, may not respect the sensitivities of the communities. Uh, we said to a museum, we want to really think about who this person is and we couldn't have asked for anyone better to do this. Hiba has been fabulous, a very collaborative uh, practitioner who has listened to many of our concerns and has been very open to ideas, but more importantly, kind of has the level of empathy that supersedes any other uh, curator that I've worked with. So thank you very much, Hiba, uh, for doing this project with us. I'll pass it to you. Thank you so much, Nithan, uh, for that very generous introduction. And uh, Honestly, the privilege and honor has been all mine uh, to work on this project has been incredibly eye-opening, uh, especially as someone who is not originally from here. Um, but I'll start quickly by just describing, um, I am a North African uh, female with dark hair. I'm currently sitting on my green chair in my home studio in Toronto. Um, so as Nithan was mentioning, I was brought on to this project uh, to help organize and curate this archive and curate these incredible stories that you have been hearing tonight. And um, what I kind of discovered in lots of conversations with Nithan and others on this call um, is that this story was not told in the media in an honest and truthful way. And I think that as an artist who thinks about um, archives and thinks about how history is told, I was so compelled by the story that the Tamil community here in Canada and also just globally was uh, really telling and pushing and that resilience um, was so powerful to me. So I was uh, very excited to be a part of this and um, I'm gonna sh share my screen here and just give a little bit of um, background. So Gardner, and we found this to be a really appropriate place to um, print some really large scale, uh, eight foot by 12 foot prints of some of the images from the archive so that when people are kind of walking and you know just doing their daily routines, they can see these images and also be reminded or if they've never seen them before, uh, learn about um, what these protests were in their own community and hopefully, um, you know, uh, 
also visit the website and, and visit Museum of Toronto and Tamil Civic Action site to um, get involved or help support and kind of build out that network of um, resilience. So, um, but of course, this archive would have been nothing without um, the content and without some of the stories that we're hearing here today. So I wanted to um, take a moment and introduce um, Ghana Arumugam from Ninukuvail. And um, Ninavukal is a Tamil word that means memories. And it started as an online web portal medium in 2008 to document the lifestyle and expression of Tamils in the GTA. Um, the unity of the Tamil community and their determination to stand for their political views are some of the key moments that are ha uh, captured um, by Nina Kuval. And this magazine publication came to reality in 2011 as their annual publication. Um, and they capture many moments um, as, large, as large as like gatherings at the Rogers Center to open grounds events. And for almost a decade, they have been an integral part of the Tamil community in the GTA. So we're so lucky here to have um, Ghana with us tonight. And I just wanted to start by asking you, Ghana, if you could tell us a little bit about your background and how you actually got involved with the 2008 and 2009 protests. Thanks, Kiba, for, for the opportunity. <coughs> Um, just for the people who's listening in the audio, I'm sitting in Markham at my house in a white sofa. Uh, <laughs> so actually, um, I got to know about the issue when I was 17, the 1983 riots happened. I was living in Jaffna. There are a lot of people come in shapes as kind of refugees within the country itself. So a lot of relatives I've seen come through trouble. Then the momentum of friction starts uh, within Tamil militants and the and the government started uh, growing. So my parents uh, kind of feared I will be either will be part of militants or I will be you know uh, dead. So this is either one one choice you will have. So they kicked me out of uh, Sri Lanka when I was 18. So I went to India, did my uh, degree in computer engineering, and came in early 20 is in my um, 28 here to Canada. So I I started observing what is happening and in back home, how it's been covered in the medias, uh, in the Western medias. But I've seen a very little information being shared uh, uh, in the Western world. So I was trying to educate my coworkers, uh, whoever I see and so on. I was doing that. Then I kind of realized that uh, when we had some events to demonstrate our feelings and emotions. So there are small pocket pocket events happen with dramas and dances and so on. So I just wanted to start documenting that. That's how we started that. Then the, the days goes by in 2008, things are going beyond our hand and the, we have lost so many people. And you know, I do have family back home. So I have uh, information directly from them. So I don't need to hear from any media as such. So I was able to gather information. I kind of feel odd. I saved my life, come to Canada, but I'm not able to contribute towards the cause by any means. So that's that's why I started seriously documenting regardless of the weather, where this happened. So I tried to go everywhere the protest happened, try to document it because I know for sure that's it's not going to be documented by the mainstream media. So let's, why don't we take a chance to document our own? That's why I started. Amazing. And, and do you have a background in photography or is this something that you just, you know, kind of took on yourself um, when you saw the need for it come up? Yeah, actually, um, I had a passion from my childhood, but I couldn't afford to do it. Uh, but no sooner can I come to this country, I, I was able to buy a camera on my own. So I was just covering like, you know, events and my friends uh, or relatives weddings and so on. That's what I was doing in the initial stage. When it's become a requirement and I noticed that no one else is documenting it. So why shouldn't I do that? So I wanted to do some contribution towards it. Uh, so since I had some background, I was able to have a job in IT, so I had a flexible uh, job where I can take time off to go and cover events when it's, uh, I was working in the downtown. So my, I told my manager what 
what the community is going through. So he was flexible enough for me. He said, whenever you want to go and cover it, cover it, that, uh, to do your job in the night or whatever. So this is an IT job, so it was kind of flexible. So I was able to to do um, uh, all these stuff. So I, I had to get a good camera to cover all these things. So I was able to do that. Uh, in fact, I can, um, at University Avenue, I dropped one of my lenses, which is $2,300 worth of lens. I was trying to change it. My hands are frozen, and uh, <laughs> I didn't even know that it dropped. So I had memories like that. That's amazing. I mean, you can't tell from looking at the images at all. They're so uh, compelling and powerful and evocative and really tell such a strong story of what happened and um, is such a huge part of this archive. And it was such an honor for me to look through the images and just see that story come to life um, as someone who wasn't there uh, to bear witness. Um, and so just to kind of ask you one final question here, I'm curious how it feels for you to look back on these images now that it's been, um, this time This time has passed. Yeah, in fact, uh, when I was doing, when I was covering it, I kind of feeling that why is happening, why we are not getting attention from the mainstream, that a lot of question in my mind. So one thing I have kind of found is uh, human have a lot of identities. So you may have a nationality, you may have a language, you may have a gender, you may have a type of relationship, you may have so many different things uh, a human go into an identity. So how other people take it and take it for their advantage or whatever the situation is. So I never felt I'm a Canadian when, when these protests are happening. I can be frank about that. There's no shame about it. it. Just I have a piece of paper to identify myself as a Canadian, but my words or our, our cries never been taken to full consideration by the time. So now I felt my voices are being heard to an ex extent and we are able to educate the fellow Canadians from, from here to Vancouver. Uh, they do know who are Tamils and what the pain they went through. Uh, so all the histories, the person who have kind of spoke about the Ghana Gateway as radio host, they become a mayor of Toronto. So it, it, is, it, is, it, it is history. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, it has a different types of opinion changed over time. And so somehow we could influence the community. Now you can go back and see what has happened. No one can hide it, it didn't happen. So history has can only be written if we have evidences. So that's evidences are done by that time. So I was so impressed about the youngsters uh, during the protest and the youngsters kind of born Canadian. So their voice is slightly have more influence than an immigrant Canadian I have. So so it is, it is say now identity, just for an example, I have to tell. Is identity, uh, like for example, in a social media, even a hashtag become a trouble now. Okay, so so one social media just trying to uh, do that uh, Tamil or Tamil realm, then within one day the youngsters protest it came back. So it's we need to voice things because people don't have a knowledge. Someone influenced them and they just take make decisions. So identities we need to to talk about it. We need to make sure that. Uh, this has happened, so I'm so happy that uh, uh, my museum and th this effort is is going to educate people more and more. Thank you. That's so well said. Thank you so much, Donna, for have ever uh, speaking with us today. And um, your images are, have already been uh, enjoyed by so many people. Even when I was installing them, so many people were stopping and asking us questions about them. And so it's such an important part of Toronto history. So thank you for sharing those with us. Thank you. And uh, I'll just pass it back to Nithan. Thank you. Thank you, Hiba, and thank you, Gana, um, for your work on, on documenting the protest. And, and it's important historic tool for us to, to share and to learn from. So thanks to, thanks to both of you. We have the last section now after that, we'll go into Q&A. So we'll get to the last section quickly. We have four people who will be reflecting on their work currently. What's, what's happening uh, with respect to the Tamil genocide, what's happening with respect to the call for justice related to the genocide today. Um, we will start with uh, the prophecy. His uh, name is Rajivan Satyasilan. Uh, stage name is The Prophecy, and he's a Canadian recording artist, rapper, songwriter, percussionist, and music producer. He was uh, born in 
Jeff Nato musical family and has done many, many, many uh, shows, many um, singles and has produced many musical productions. So I will put his full bio in the, in the chat. We, we are going to have him join, but before, uh, before we uh, talk to him, I think I will see a small clip of a recent video that he, recent single that he's released. Uh, we'll look at it, two minutes of that, and then we'll come to, to Rajiv. for that. Uh, so Rajivan, we just saw a clip of the video that you launched. You can see the link on the chat if you want to receive, if you want to see the whole video. Um, the reason we played that video is that, you know, you were part of the protest in, in 2008, 2009. And the way we see protest has evolved from our own experiences. And this video showcases protest across the world, uh, protests that took place earlier, protests that are taking place, for example, the farmers protest in, in India and so on. So, um, Let's, let's hear your reflection of how, how the protest has shaped you and how you view the world today has been informed by what went on in 2009. Yes, um, thank you. Thank you, Nitin and I, and um, when I come to everyone, um, thank you for having me uh, a part of this event, uh, such, such an historic event, and I'm truly honored. Um, so uh, I came to Canada as a refugee in the early 90s, and uh, I grew up in Rexdale, Ontario. Um, and as we all know, the 90s was a very different time compared to now anyways. Um, and, uh, you know, and it was a really confusing time for me as a young kid because it wasn't only about identifying who I was and where I'm from, but also learning about the new cultures around me. And I think I carried that kind of self-doubt and lack of identity throughout my teenage years. So um, 2009 for me was a, a pivotal point in my life, I can say. Actually... I can confidently say that it saved my life because, um, you know, uh, I was definitely heading in a very dangerous direction. So um, being a part of these protests was was just surreal. I mean, that kind of energy really woke me up and uh, inspired me to do more for my people and the struggle. Um, and uh, what could I do? You know what I mean? Like there was there was so many um, youth involved and so many organizations involved that were trying to put um, our message forward. And um, the only thing I knew was music. So so my goal was to um, my goal was to create um, music about our struggles for the international community. So I began writing songs in English to educate the international community about the genocide and the injustice. Uh, innocent Tamil civilians were enduring at the hands of the Sri Lankan government. 
Um, my first original release was titled I Have a Dream, um, deeply inspired by the great Martin Luther King. Uh, the song really blew up and I believe it inspired a movement of independent artists from all over the world who felt the need to tell their story. Um, so uh, looking back at my life journey, I can confidently say that 2009 changed my life and um, it, it inspired me to do so much more. And um, my, my goal now is to continue to create so that uh, my children and future generations have something to reflect on. Um, and, um, you know, I'm just so happy that we've come this far to a point where we can have these kind of conversations because I think they're very important, um, not only to talk about just our struggles, but the struggles the world is facing, you know, especially with this pandemic and all the protests all over the world. So again, thank you so much, Nitin Anna and my CM and the Tamil Canadian Center for Civic Action for hosting these kind of events. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, the prophecy Rajivan for all your work and thanks for the, the the contribution through arts. And the reason we wanted to include you into the second section is that the, the number of artists, uh, young artists who have come out of the protest and have started to produce a lot of independent music, independent short films and films and so on that are depicting the, uh, telling the story uh, through multimedia and, and you're an example, a great example of that. So we're glad to have you in, the, in this section where we're looking forward to what's next means we want to see more artists take on uh, the role of, uh, of, of what you're doing to make sure that we are able to continue to tell the stories, to, to, to share those stories that we don't see in the media often. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Divya Balendran. Divya is a Ulam Tamil community organizer based in Toronto, uh, is an advocacy organizer with Canada at PEARL. PEARL is uh, the acronym for People for Equality and Relief in Lanka. She holds a Bachelor of Sociology and minor in politics from Ryerson University and has a graduate certificate in international development. Through her work at Pearl, she engages in advocacy and knowledge mobilization on human rights issues concerning the Tamil homeland. Her interest lies in exploring themes of displacement, identity, and survival in diaspora and racialized communities. I also have to say Divya was uh, an instrumental part of uh, this exhibit last year. Uh, the, the exhibit was supposed to happen last year and she had prepared almost all the contents that necessary to, to be brought to this uh, this far. So thank you, uh, Divya, for all of your work with this uh, project as well. So we would like to hear from you, your reflection and the work that Pearl is doing in the current context. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really thankful to be part of this project and grateful to see it come to life again with the physical and virtual exhibit. Um, this project has been very meaningful uh, to me, so I'm happy to be here. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Divya. Uh, my pronouns are she and her. A little description of myself and my surroundings. I'm a Ulatamo woman. I have dark curly hair, wearing a black sweater, sitting in my room in Scarborough. Um, so first I'd like to give a brief overview of Pearl and who we are and what we do. And then I'll provide um, some insight into the current realities and human rights situation happening on the ground in Sri Lanka. So Pearl is, um, uh, stands for People for Equality and Relief in Lanka. Um, we are a US-based uh, global advocacy organization with close relationships with local partners in the North and East and with policymakers around the world to elevate attention to ongoing human rights issues in Sri Lanka. We work at the intersection of engaging with policymakers, conducting independent research with our close collaborators in the North and East, uh, pursuing strategic litigation, as well as knowledge mobilization initiatives to achieve justice and accountability for Sri Lanka's mass atrocities. So what we saw from these protests in 2009 were calls on the international community to take action on what at the time the UN called a bloodbath happening to Tamil people in Mulibaikal. The deliberate targeting of Tamil civilians in government and UN designated safe zones by Sri Lankan army is what constituted the Mulibaikal massacre as a genocide. It was a deliberate attempt to massacre Tamil civilians and occupy the last remaining LTT territory. And in the diaspora, the Tamil refugees scattered across the globe heard of daily massacres unfolding in 2009. We began protesting at the end of 2008 and mass mobilized in 2009. Our calls for a ceasefire to end the genocide were also widely ignored. So today we call for justice and accountability for Sri Lanka's mass atrocities, specifically during the 2009 genocide. So since 2009, not a single Sri Lankan perpetrator of war crimes, crimes against humanity or genocide has been held accountable through international criminal justice mechanism. This impunity enables issues such as enforced disappearances, military occupation and land grabs to persist in the traditional Tamil homeland. 
What is also very cruel is the repression of memorialization in the Northeast. So last year on May 18th, Thelma Genocide Remembrance Day, the Sri Lankan army militarized the area surrounding the Thulam Ulams, which are the LTTE grave sites, intimidating Thelma families from commemorating their loved ones. So in spite of this, thousands gathered to collectively grieve their profound loss. Every year, Thelma resistance survives while violence and impunity remain the norm on the island. So although, Sri Lanka, although the Sri Lankan state's narrative suggests that violence on the island ended with the armed conflict, human rights violations and repression continue to occur under the single Buddhist nationalist state. Sri Lanka still remains one of the most heavily militarized regions in the world, and we continue to see Tamil and Muslim communities face intimidation and harassment by the military and the state, notably as the families of the disappeared surpass 1500 days of continued protests to demand answers and truth for their disappeared loved ones. These protests are led by elderly mothers who wish to know what has happened to their loved ones and ultimately seek justice for Sri Lanka's genocide against the Tamil people. So the election of Gotabaya Rajapaksa, who served as the defense um, secretary during May 2009 as president and his brother Mahinda Rajapaksa as prime minister now, are the clearest examples of the complete impunity enjoyed by the Sri Lankan government. Both have been credibly accused of grave human rights abuses during the final stage stages of the armed conflict, including torture, deliberate food shortages, and bombing of civilians in what was deemed as no-fire zones. In fact, those who are credibly accused of committing war crimes have been promoted into high-ranking positions of power within government and military with impunity, leaving Tamil human rights defenders particularly vulnerable. Even the recent arrest of the mayor of Jaffna, Viswalingam Manivanin, highlights the arbitrary nature of arrest and detention of Tamil civilians under its notorious terrorism investigation department. So at this juncture, there is no faith in domestic options for justice and accountability for human rights violations in 2009. The situation continues to deteriorate in an ongoing way, rooted in decades of oppressive policy and state-sponsored state colonization. The resistance in the diaspora, and particularly in the homeland, is strong and, and growing. We saw that during the PTP protests this year, where Tamil and Muslim civilians marched in thousands against Singhala Buddhist majoritarianism and the ongoing protests by the families of the disappeared. So the fight for Tamil self-determination has, has undergone various shifts since the island's independence, but our dedication and resolute bravery has always been a central tenet to our struggle. As Pearl continues to advocate for, advocate for political and legal genocide recognition, accountability for mass atrocities, and self-determination for the Tamil people, we do so carrying the memory of the past in our work and relying on the resilience and strength of our people for the future. So I hope this provides some context into the current um, human rights situation in Sri Lanka and why we continue to fight for justice and accountability. Thank you. Thank you very much, Devia, and thanks for the work you're doing with Pearl as well. Thank you for joining and thanks for giving a context of what is going on currently in, in Sri Lanka, in the island of Sri Lanka. Um, our next speaker is going to talk a little bit more about documentation of the genocide itself. As you know, um, after 2009, as the military occupies many of the areas that have been sites of the genocide, a lot of the evidence have been uh, have, are continuing to be destroyed and a lot of intimidation is continuing to be the the reality today. So it becomes very important for the diaspora to be engaged in various forms of documentation. So we have Vail Vailai the Pule, who's the board of direct, who's one of the board of directors at Tamil Genocide Memorial, um, speaking to us next. He's a software engineer by profession and live in Ottawa, community activist, and he's held different roles at several Tamil community organizations and Canadian political uh, parties as well. So uh, Vail, uh, take it from here and let us know what you've been working on. Sure. Uh, thanks, Nathan, and uh, thanks for uh, MyCM and uh, the Tamil Civic Action for uh, giving the opportunity to uh, present uh, on behalf of uh, uh, Tamil Genocide Memorial. Uh, I'm actually Vail Vail Adapulai, and uh, I live in Ottawa, and I'm actually speaking from my uh, home office, uh, still at the uh, middle of the work. Um, so uh, the Tamil uh, Genocide Memorial, uh, we started uh, in 2016 uh, in order to preserve the uh, artifacts and historical artifacts of Tamil Ulam and Tamils. The reason is, uh, uh, please move to the next slide. Uh, uh, the reason is um, the, the memory is getting lost and uh, as few of the uh, speakers mentioned before, 
uh, even now the social media and uh, other modern era uh, tools uh, or digital um, world uh, apply censorship on uh, Tamil historical artifacts. Uh, this is a major problem for future generation because uh, if the uh, artifacts uh, like videos and uh, documents and all these get lost within this five or 10 uh, years time frame, then the uh, future of our generation, especially the Tamil uh, diaspora, next generations, they won't be able to have the, the Tamil side of the history. They will get the history from the, uh, the media. The media actually played a negative role in our struggle. Um, so basically they hide the Tamil side of the story and then uh, multiply or escalate uh, or extra great the uh, stories told by the Sri Lankan government. Uh, please, next slide. So the so we actually um, focus on uh, preserving the Tamil Ulam uh, documents, uh, especially the last year project. We did a digital archive so that we found that most of the Tamil Ulam video documentaries uh, that existed before 2009 uh, get deleted by the YouTube and Facebook and other social medias, uh, citing that um, it's the terrorist um, documents, but it's not really. And um, those, uh, especially around like 120 of Olivia documents existed before, but now there's only 50 or 60 available. So we put this uh, digital archive and uh, let users able to upload the videos and then uh, try to preserve it in, uh, preserved in, um, in a digital archive. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, this, uh, we were able to uh, retrieve around 40 plus um, such uh, two hours were long, e each, each of the only which was two hours long. And the other issue is the, the Tamil struggle is a legitimate struggle, but the media and others um, actually portrayed is as a, um, a terrorist problem, but it's not really. Uh, it's a decolonization failure by the British when they left Sri Lanka. So uh, these stories are not um, really, even now, it didn't really get to the wider population, um, either Canadian population or the worldwide, um, because the, the, the so much of media framing done uh, before that, that's the one of the reason that the Gardner Express um, protests were seen by the media and other the public opinion were, were uh, kind of negative that time. So um, uh, next slide, please. So that's why uh, the Tamil Genocide Memorial, um, a registered nonprofit organization in Canada is focusing on getting the, uh, the artifact uh, digitally preserved first and then uh, move on to a physical uh, museum or archive kind in future. Um, so we are very, um, uh, very appreciative that the work that the Myceum are doing it now, and uh, we will learn from a lot uh, from that, uh, that, and then try to apply um, uh, in, in the same kind of process um, into this uh, Tamil genocide memorial in future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bill, from Tamil Genocide Memorial for joining and, and sharing your, uh, your update on what's being done. So the final speaker for the day is from Coalition 104. Uh, coalition 104 is a coalition of Tamil grassroots organizations and activists formed to uh, advance the process of uh, getting the Bill 104 that's at the provincial parliament passed. Yadusha Selvaraja. Yadusha Selvaraja is an undergraduate student, soon to be graduate with a Bachelor of Science degree. She's been volunteering with Tamil Canadian Centre for Civic Action and also helped out with the inaugural Tiyaki Taliban Food Drive and currently 
volunteers as a social media content creator for the coalition for one, Bill 104. So Jitusha would be the last speaker and then we'll go to questions. If you have any questions, please type it in the, in the quick Q&A section. If you like a question in the Q&A section that you want it to be prioritized, please like so that that will be prioritized as well. Go ahead, Yadusha. Awesome. Thank you, Nizanna. Hello and vanakam, everyone. My name is Yadusha and I am a Elam Tamil woman with dark curly brown hair joining from my home in Ontario. And I'm a volunteer representative for Coalition 104. I'd like to first thank my ZM of Toronto for creating this inclusive plat platform for the Tamil community. I also want to express my gratitude and respect to the rest of the panelists for openly sharing their experiences regarding the Tamil genocide and the historic and present day demonstrations of resistance. I'd like to begin by talking about how Coalition 104 came to be. Coalition 104 is a united grassroots community of organizations, artists, businesses, working professionals, and youth that united for one shared cause, advocating to pass Bill 104 to bring comprehensive awareness to the Tamil genocide. What is Bill 104? This may be a question that arises for both the non-Tamil and Tamil communities. To be concise, Bill 104 was proposed in 2019 to proclaim an annual seven day period concluding on the 18th of May as Tamil Genocide Education Week. This bill's purpose is to bring awareness to the Tamil genocide through listening spaces with genocide survivors, sharing their firsthand experiences. However, after the bill's second reading, progression to the third has been stalled for over 700 days. Decades of oppression and brutalities of mass killing, physical torture, enforced disappearances, and the intentional destruction of the Tamil heritage in Elam have yet to be acknowledged as a genocide. In the international community, the enabling of the genocide can be observed through media silencing and censorship. In the Western world, time and time again, the Tamil diaspora have engaged in public demonstrations with the hopes to bring these atrocities to the attention of the public eye and attain justice. Yet these continue to be inadequate attempts for proactive solutions. That being said, the implementation of Bill 104 is imperative to publicly recognize that past and present aspects of the Tamil genocide is an act, act against humanity. The exclusion of the Tamil genocide and genocides alike in education repress, represses these identities. It can also result in students to believe that the select few genocides addressed in the curriculum are the only deviations of history rather than a concern of contemporary society. Students need to gain knowledge on the preconditions of various genocides and the international community's role to appreciate that genocide is preventable. This exposure through academia fosters curiosity, desire for change, and conversation among their friends and family. Such acknowledgement will honor the Elam Tamil lives that were lost and spark a sense of courage for those who were and are suffering. It will create a space for dialogue that is not associated with stigma to reduce fear in sharing one's true identity. Ultimately, it addresses the Tamil community's desire to maintain awareness of all genocides to be the equivalent to planting a seed for the, for the discussion on intervention and prevention. My roots will always be a significant part of my identity that has only strengthened through self-interest and passion. And I hope as a first generation Tamil student speaking here today, I have encouraged at least one individual to explore their own heritage or to take a stand to resist injustice in all shapes and form. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much Zadusha for that. And thanks for your work with Coalition 104, incredible amount of work being done to make sure that the Bill 104 gets passed. It's, uh, it's stuck uh, at second reading, uh, after second reading for about 700 days now. Um, we were we were we are about ten minutes behind, but we are wrapped up with all the speakers. Now we can go into Q and A uh, for another ten minutes, and um, so we have the first question that's uh, being prioritized up is around um, what the approach was from uh, from the Canadian government. I think all panelists can have a look at the question. You can see the question. Uh, the question reads that. Uh, 
um, the Canadian government uh, mainly focused on war on terror in the earlier stages. And after 2009, um, in 2011, uh, Harper government shifted to condemning the Sri Lankan government in stronger terms. So, um, so the, the attendee uh, would like to know what happened and, and why the shift in policy, uh, if someone can uh, jump in to talk about that. Uh, anyone from the panel wants to jump in? Uh, right, Will, briefly. Uh, uh, sure. I think the reason uh, probably the war crimes uh, evidence that actually uh, came to know by the UN um, since the war crimes, actually the solid evidence came to the world, um, the Western and European government has to react in order to save their faces uh, because they couldn't really do effectively due to the geopolitics. They couldn't really, they, they, if they would, they would be able to uh, stop this genocide by 2009. So they failed to do it. So they basically tried to react later. Yeah, I think one of the other things, I, if I may jump in, is that you know um, the Harper government initially came to power uh, with a tough on terror kind of message. And one of the communities that was scapegoated in that process was the Tamil community as well as part of the uh, tough on crime, tough on uh, you know tough on terror type thing. And that that carried forward during the first term significantly. And as more Tamil communities engaged in conversation and shaping uh, policies within the party, it shifted a bit, but the early damage was done in the sense that it was, um, the government wasn't able to get over the fact that they had that image that they needed to protect of being tough on terror that prevented them from seeing thousands and thousands of uh, Canadians that were on the protest. So, um, so the shift was very much welcomed by the community, uh, but definitely uh, many of us still hold the, the lack of inaction, uh, lack of action in the early stages, uh, the silence in the early stages of the protest still uh, to be something that is accounted for. Anyone else wants to talk about this? Um, Priyant, go ahead. Uh, so yeah, uh, I think it, it really doesn't matter like whether it's liberal or conservative at this point in time, because they are mostly reacting to uh, their own uh, narrative, right? They weren't, they weren't reacting to what we were telling them. They weren't reacting to the fact that thousands and thousands of Tamils were being uh, murdered, right? Using chemical weapons, cluster bombs, uh, heavy artillery, right? Um, it's, it's, it's a clear intent of genocide, right? But, but if you look at the narrative, they make it seem like, oh, you know, there's a war between two parties and you're completely in, there, there's war crimes happening. And, you know, this, this is the same sort of attitude that led to people uh, on the Sun Sea, the MV Sun Sea and the Ocean Lady, right? Being detained as calling terrorists, right? And, and these people were seeking refugee. Like what, what did they do just, just because they're Tamil? Right, nothing else, nothing else, just because they were Tamil on a boat heading away from like persecution somewhere around the world, somewhere around like the Sindal academic tipped the intelligence agencies calling them terrorists. And this is all that was enough to, you know, for them being detained, put to trauma and torture. And one, one, one of them was a victim of a serial killer, right? This, this is the sort of, sort of, persecution we are being put through by the Canadian government itself, right? So to be honest, I, I don't think it's, it's the Liberal Party or the Conservative Party. I think that there needs to be a shift in narrative, right? The, the shift in narrative should be that there's an ongoing genocide and the world governments need to start paying attention to this because Tamil people continue to lose their homelands as we speak about it. And I think this is where we start by holding uh, the Canadian government complicit when it comes to the genocide back home. Mm -hmm. Definitely, I think that's that's an important point. Uh, the the political system itself uh, did not see the Tamil Canadians as Canadians, uh, whether whether they recognized uh, them as as the grievances as legitimate grievances or the grievances as something that they needed to respond to, and and that also uh, is an important lesson for all of us to to kind of keep in mind as well. 
Um, the the other thing that that you mentioned, I wanted to kind of make sure that it's 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 clarified as well that the person who was one of the people who was a victim of the a serial killer in in downtown um, was also denied uh, denied um, immigration status after coming and had to be um, underground uh, and and therefore the disappearance wasn't also uh, addressed as much so the the vulnerability was made further. Uh, by the fact that the immigration status wasn't uh, wasn't granted to us to somebody who was seeking asylum coming through um, through many many months of hardship through a ship uh, all the way from South Asia. Um, so let's go to the next question. If anybody else wants to talk, it's it's a big conversation. Um, you know, there's obviously uh, milestones and and small victories that we see with different levels of government uh, with recognition and so on, but ultimately the greatest form of accountability around this genocide hasn't come from any, any level of government, any form of uh, uh, real tangible results. So, so we are still victims of lip service, I would say. And I think um, to a certain extent, the progress uh, is there, but I always say we should measure the progress with the magnitude of the problem. You know, if the magnitude of the problem is so huge, if it's a small progress, celebrating that doesn't take us anywhere close to, uh, close to solutions as we see in race relations in this country as well. Um, we have a question about uh, how can people contribute to this uh, Images of Resistant Digital Archive. I'll get Hiba to talk and then maybe someone else. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, that's a really great question, <laughs> but I think that it should come through uh, Tamil Civic Action or Museum of Toronto um, to connect us, to see like different ways that we can connect to people in the community and maybe people that are part of the Tamil uh, community who are um, out of today's circle, right? And, and kind of bring them into that narrative and that history like we're talking about. So um, I, I would reach out to Tamil Civic Action um, and that's kind of the quickest, um, the quickest connection to, to me because that's who I've been uh, closely working with and we can figure out a way to connect and expand that community, so. So if you if you were thanks Eva, if you were somebody who had participated in the in the protest and have video or photos to share and contribute to the exhibit, please send it to us and and contribute those. If you were someone who was participating and didn't have video or uh, or photos or or anything, but want to reflect either in an artistic format or in a written format or in audio format, video format, your reflections are welcome as well. Um, if you didn't have any sense of the protest, but you you were listening to it and now have become more aware and want to contribute, if you want to donate towards the cause, there are multiple ways to get involved. As, as Sajusta mentioned, one of the reasons why we are doing this is not just about Tamil community. It's also about planting the seed for prevention of uh, the genocide, planting the seeds for celebrating activism. You know, these things are, are important to recognize. Protests are part of democracy. In fact, that's what makes democracy work. And and we should not shy away from. And the, celebrating these protests also makes Tamil community realize why protest is important on a continuous basis so that we can appreciate why there are other protests that are happening. When we hear about other protests that are happening, we have a worldview that is appreciative of the fact that people are putting their time and effort into, into a course that, that we need to pay a little bit more attention to. So please contribute your, uh, your content or your thoughts, your, your volunteer hours, whichever way you want to contribute, reach out to us and we can uh, you can do that. And we'll finish with this last question, which asks, what advice do you give to Tamil activists today? Um, that's that's an important question to, uh, to ask. Um, maybe any of the any of the fellow activists want to jump in. What advice would you have? What kind of directions would you be able to? I would I would say that like um, since we are in the information world, you have to be proactive to look at how our related information being suppressed in the in the online medium by any means, you need to voice that out. Actually, I had a first-hand experience that when they had some hashtag was uh, uh, banned, um, my son has done his own demonstration to go against it. So it, it is within 24 hours that hashtag came back. So, so we need to like, the younger generation, they have technology knowledge, they have the background, they have the communication skills and everything they have. So we need to find a way to, to educate others. And if something is misleading or whatever the case is, we need to educate others. So it's not a 
Tamil issue should be looked at as a Canadian issue. If it's, if it's an organization trying to do in Canada, it's, it's not doing for 100 Tamils, it's doing for 100 Canadians. That's how the things has to be looked at it. Then the politicians have to represent in a Canadian prospect. They do business in Canada. So if they want to do something in the Canadian territory without the knowledge of a law or whatever that legal uh, amendment is, without that someone in a bureaucracy, if they do it, that is not applicable to, uh, in a legal manner. So we need to kind of educate that and um, and voice about it. Priyant and Vel, did you have answers to this one or it was from before the hand? Sorry, sorry. Velana, do you want to go before me? Uh, no, go ahead. Thank you, Velana. Uh, so um, one thing I would say is um, it, it is time to step up. I, I don't think we have to wait anymore. The more as time goes by, colonization and assimilation is happening in the Tamil homelands. And secondly, there needs to be a shift in narrative because all this while we are, we are letting um, the governments that are complicit in the ongoing Tamil genocide to control our narrative, right? And I, I think it's time the young Tamils started taking control of this narrative along with everyone else and push forward that, you know, we are the victims of this, right? There's there's no division. We we fought against this, like we fought against this genocide and we were oppressed and we continue to be oppressed, right? That's the line we should be taking. I, I think the best way to learn about this is, is learn from movements like Black Lives Matter, right? Learn from like the current, um, rent strike protests that are happening, right? Stand in solidarity with them because, because this is where the shift in narrative happens. You don't let uh, your oppressors tell you how you govern your struggle, how we move our struggle forward. We tell people how our, how our struggle moves forward and our terms and conditions, right? Because it's, it's Tamil sovereignty, right? It's, it's not about what the US wants or what other countries wants. It's our sovereignty, our political rights, the future of our, our younger generation, right? So, so step up and I think bring the narrative back to our, our playground. That's what I'd say. Okay, we'll wrap up with Will. Any quick comments, Will? Uh, sure, I think the, um, uh, for, for in order to be a good activist, uh, persistent and uh, don't burn out, uh, the reason is actually uh, it's a long-term uh, struggle. So um, uh, if you burn out uh, within a short time, like a one year or two, you won't be able to do things after that. So um, um, plan for a long struggle and uh, in order to get justice, uh, it might take 100 years because uh, the Armenian genocide was recognized after 100 years. So they had to really work like 100 years. That's mean pretty much three generations. So uh, as Tamil Canadian, we have to expect that long uh, to get justice. So uh, that's uh, my two cents. Thanks. Yeah. I, I, I'm sure we all have different views and opinions and things like that on this panel too. We don't have enough time to debate uh, on many of these topics, but but I think um, the multitude of ideas is always good. You know, you pick your space based on what what you feel comfortable. You know, I would be one of those people who would say it may take hundred years, but let's hope to get it in two years. Uh, you know, let's work as if we want it in two years without burning out. And I think one of the things that Priyan said is, is something that I want to reiterate is that um, for the longest time uh, before 2009, a lot of our attention was on the white politicians, Eurocentric models of governance. And we spent so much time trying to convince them to help. We forgot who was beside us, who our neighbors were, who were similar uh, pe people with similar struggles. And I think we have younger generation taking this leadership on to kind of make those connections with the indigenous solidarity movement, make this connection with the Black Lives Matter, make it about fighting Islamophobia. All of us, all of our struggles are connected and then true solidarity emerges. And to be open about what, what we want and not to be compromising our positions just because of what seems attainable as Priyant mentioned, you know, there was a time when we were told, don't use the word genocide. And there were some organizations that are willing to take those words in from their pamphlets and so on. And who determines what genocide is? Who determines what kind of terms they want to associate with? I think just wanting to have our politicians come to our event should not be the criteria of we determining what our event should be. And so there are a lot of work to be done. And that 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 sense of ownership, while while knowing that we are we are a settler community, we have our obligations, we have a responsibility to be 
uh, in solidarity with with the indigenous communities. We also have to own the fact that we are part of Canada building this country and no, not let Eurocentric models tell us that we are subhuman or guests in this country that we need to keep it on in our own spaces. And that's what has been happening in many of our, many of our spaces. Our parents, our, our previous generations feel like they are guests here. They've been given an opportunity to live and survive here. So we have to tone it down and we have to and and we have to break out of that uh, that space and come out and say we need this attention because we deserve this attention because we own uh, the contributions that we have made to this place. So I'll leave it as that. Thank you everybody for joining. In closing, I want to thank all the speakers. Thank you, Hiba, Abdullah, Gana Armuham, Angela Rainier, Caroline Egan, the Prophecy, Priyanth Nalaratnam, Arani Murugan, and Divya Balindra and Jadusha Shalvaraja and Vail Vail Aidapula. Thank you very much for taking your time to attend this session and launching this event. Please uh, visit the digital exhibit uh, at uh, www.imagesofresistance.com. The link will be shared on the chat. Also, if you, when the stay at home order is lifted, please uh, go there to visit the Fort York Vista Center. The exhibit will be there till the end of the month or in May. So it'll be there for a month and a half. Uh, from today. So you have enough time. Hopefully uh, we have the stay at home order lifted soon. But if you live close by there and if you're going for a walk, check it out. And and we are hoping to, we were hoping to expand the display. We are actually hoping to have an exhibit inside Fort York Mr. Center. So this is not the end. We will continue to build on this exhibit, build on the stories from the resistance that we had organized. And thank you everybody for coming. And thank you very much to Myzeum of Toronto for collaborating on this project. It's been a, a pleasure working with you uh, and it's been uh, a, a true honor to be able to tell our stories through the work that Mycelium is doing uh, as well. Thank you everybody and have a great evening. And we'll, we have this video on Facebook uh, as well. So please feel free to go back and check, go back and share it with anybody who might have missed it. The video will still be available on Facebook. Thank you everyone. Have a great evening. Thank you. <laughs>